So if you see one of the leaders of the children today before you leave, you give them a hug. <laughs> right? Because I'm going to be on, right? Absolutely. Because I was watching them do all their motions and I was out of breath. You know what I mean? I mean, it was, it was, it was insane. And, uh, and they, they did a great job. And I know a lot of the kids, I got, I got to be, I'm just going to say it. These kids got there and memorized a lot of the scriptures. And I was thinking, what's our excuses, right? Amen. So they did, they did, the kids did phenomenal. Give them a hug, and you see them. Tell them they did a good job. <clears throat> so for me, Christmas is, is, is really a... There's two messages that I have the most trouble. Christmas and Easter. Because every year is Christmas and Easter. And how many new ways can you talk about Christmas and Easter without being the same message, Right? So what, I, what, I, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you three questions that people ask me about Christmas, and I get these all the time. Um, and the first question I have is, should Christians celebrate Christmas? Because I don't know about you, but you might have some super religious people in your background or in your family, and they're like, you know, Christmas is all about paganistic rituals. You know, the tree in your house is, has roots to paganism, and, 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 and you'll hear people say these questions and stuff, and so... The question I always have is, Pastor, is that true? And then, um, should we celebrate Christmas as Christians? Do we honor the Lord when we celebrate a holiday that might not be in Christian roots? Because let me just be honest with you and tell you this, that Jesus never celebrated Christmas. He celebrated Hanukkah. Matter of fact, when Jesus is speaking, and in, in I think it's uh, the book of John, when he gives the speech, I am the light of the world, he gives it on Hanukkah. Think about that. They had this huge menorah in the temple, and every night of Hanukkah, they would have this, they would light it up, and they said that, historians would say that when they would light the, the light for Hanukkah, it would shine out through all of Jerusalem, and Jesus says, I am the light of the world, Amen. right? It's strong. So should we as Christians celebrate Christmas? And now you're like, oh, great, Jason, you just ruined the whole program and everything. I mean, you just... <laughs> So we're going to answer that question. The other question is, is if Jesus wasn't technically born on December 25th, what day was he actually born on? See, it's silent now. Y'all are like, wait a minute. You just rocked my whole world, Pastor. <laughs> and then my last question I have is basically, when was the first reference to Christmas in the Bible? And it might, that answer might surprise you. So let me answer the first question real quick. So should Christians celebrate Christmas. If you do your research and you study, yes, the Christmas tree has pagan roots. Yes, the giving of gifts even has a paganistic background in it. Even the time of the year, Christmas time, has a paganistic background. But the question is, is, but we as Christians, we use that day, we use December 25th because we honor and we celebrate the birth of our Savior, right? We, so we've taken it. So let me just read this to you real quick. So what day, uh, um, so let I me mean, skip that one. So, so should, we, should, should, you know, should we celebrate? So let me give you two verses real quick. First, first one is this, is Tom 24, 1. It says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all of its people belong to who? Amen. To him. So every holiday that you celebrate, let me just tell you this, you should celebrate it honoring the Lord. That means St. Patrick's Day is not the day for everybody to be Irish and get drunk. Just saying. <laughs> All right? Isn't it funny? Everybody's Irish on the 17th of March. <laughs> but, but it says that basically everything that we have in this world belongs to him and it's his. So every holiday you celebrate, you should do it with a thankful heart knowing that that day belongs to him. Now, if you have one of these super religious people that are going to come to your house on Christmas and that, that are like, just, you know, we shouldn't, you know, all this stuff, let me give you a verse to just quote to them or read to them because it's great. It says, Romans 14, verses 5 through 6, it says, In the same way, some think one day is more holy than another day, while others think every day is alike. So some days are special, some days are not, is what he's saying. But look what he says. You, sh you should each be fully convinced that whichever day, what? You. What? You. What, what, who is it? You. you. You have a choice. The day, whatever day that you choose is acceptable. 
Those who worship the Lord on a special day do it to what? To honor him. So it's very okay with the Lord for us to celebrate the birth of Jesus on December 25th. Though that day might have its roots in paganism, we don't celebrate it as a pagan. We celebrate it as a Christian. And that day is, you know, that's why you have this whole thing. Jesus is the reason for the season, for our season. Other people might not celebrate that, but for us as believers, as Christians, that becomes the day that we united collectively say, okay, it might not be the actual day, but it's the day in which we come together and we celebrate the birth of our Savior. We do it collectively as Christians. So to make a long story short, you can absolutely celebrate Christmas and you can wear your reindeer ears. You can decorate your car. The one thing I don't understand is my wife and I were driving. Is I, don't, I haven't gotten this one yet. I, I get to Santa. I get Santa in a sleigh. I get Santa in a train. I get Santa on a plane. I get Santa, you know, on a boat, whatever. Because <laughs> evidently in every yard, he's different. I'm not getting the unicorn, though. You seen the unicorn blow up with the, with the, with the, with the rainbow thing on it and the... Uh, the white, I'm like, I don't get it. There's, there, Santa's not on the ring. I mean, now, put Santa on the unicorn, I'd understand it. <laughs> right? So it's a bit funny, like, and now, and now we have, you know, Darth Vader is celebrating Christmas. <laughs> right? Luke Skywalker is now celebrating Christmas. And then you get Captain Kirk is going to celebrate Christmas. You know, so you get all these different decorations. And look, I don't care. Here's, here, here, here's what we have to... Tell your kids the reason why you celebrate Christmas. Amen. And that the real gift is him giving his life for you. Amen. Don't let commercialism, don't let all this other crazy stuff get in there and take away what we have taken as our holiday. So and, and I guess in a sense you could even say this, that the Christian, the church, has taken a pagan holiday and turned it into something that was powerful. I could see it. Probably in a church, maybe one day in the early church, they were sitting around going, you know, I don't want to celebrate this paganistic holiday, all this gift giving and stuff and all this crazy trees being brought in your house and worship. You know what we should do? We should make it a Christian. We should make the real reason why we celebrate this whole crazy, you know, five days off that we have to celebrate. Let's make it about Jesus. And I think that's probably what happened. I'm not a historian, but I could see the church. I could see a bunch of Christians. Because, you know, when a bunch of Christians get around, start talking, things can happen, right? That's how ministries are born. That's how, that's how people, you know, and that, let's not just take it for ourselves. Let's go and give to other people the way Christ gave to us. So I guess my answer to them is, yes, you can celebrate Christmas. Yes, you can take it over. Yes, you can make it about Jesus. And matter of fact, I think we should make every day about Jesus. Amen. All right, the second question is this, and I'm going to try my best to explain this one to you as best possible. If Jesus was not technically born on December 25th, then when was he actually born? Let me tell you why we know he wasn't born in December. You ready? Let me just give you a very simple one. When the shepherds were outside at night watching their sheep, okay, it's cold. They were freezing. It's like it's cold, it's cold there, and in the desert, it's just as cold. So they're not hanging out, you know, talking. They're bundled up. So they couldn't have been outside with their sheep, allowing their sheep and their, and their flock to, to be exposed to the elements. So it probably more than likely wasn't in the wintertime. Mind blown, I know. I know. So let me give you a verse real quick. Luke chapter 1. I'm going to read it from the New Living, and then I'm going to show you how there's a verse in the English Standard that's actually translated better. But the New Living says it this way in the verse 26 of Luke 1, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Now that, by reading that text right there, it says, God sent an angel Gabriel to Nazareth in a village in Galilee. So when you read that text, you're thinking, okay, the reference point is this, that Elizabeth has been pregnant already for six months, right? That's how you understand that. But if you read the ESV and a lot, a lot of other translations, they actually translate it better because it says, in, just in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee. So in other words, it was the sixth month of that year, not the sixth month of her pregnancy. Does that make sense? Okay. So now the question becomes, what is the sixth month? And right now you're going, that's easy. That's June. No, it's not. 
because you have to go by a Jewish calendar, not our calendar today. So let me read the text all the way through real quick. So that, that verse should read, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from, from God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth. So we know it was the sixth month. Verse 27, go back to the uh, New Living Translation, it says, to a virgin named Mary, she was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think of what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. Now look at verse 32. It's very important. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby will be born, uh, will be holy, and will be called the Son of God. What's more, now here's a reference, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say that she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her what? Six months. So she's six months pregnant in the sixth month. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, yes, no, maybe? Yes. Okay. In the Jewish sixth month, and we'll tell you what that is in a minute, she was six months pregnant when Mary found out and heard that she was going to be pregnant. Make sense? All right. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say that she was barren, but she has conceived the son and is now in her sixth month. And it says this, verse 37, for the word of God will never what? Fail. Fail. I love it. Here it is. You ready? In the sixth month of the Jewish calendar, it is called E-L-U-L, Elul, which is basically between August and September. So Mary found out about her pregnancy between August and September, when Elizabeth was six months pregnant. That means John the Baptist, you know, his cousin, was born, you ready for this? November or December. My birthday is November 24th. I like to believe in my study Bible, which I will write in the future, that John the Baptist was born on November 24th. So if you are November and December, more than likely, you could possibly share your birthday with John the Baptist, right? Yes. Amen. There you go. That's my November. My, if, okay, my, by the way, just so you know, if you were, if you were um, born in November, you have the right to celebrate all month long. We don't have a birthday. We have a birth month. Amen? <laughs> Amen? All right. And then there's an after birthday party, which we celebrate in December. Okay. So... So this puts, you ready for this? So this puts Jesus' birth approximately, if we would go by this text and just make approximations, so approximately Jesus' birth took place between May and June, which would make total sense because the, the shepherds and everybody was outside at night watching over their flock during the summer evening. Right? Is that crazy? So somebody would say, well, listen, so then why don't we celebrate at that time? I'm going to be honest with you. God doesn't give us a date and I, on purpose. Because I think if he gave us a date, we would probably ruin it. You know what I mean? We as humans, we have a tendency to ruin things. And so I think that's one of the reasons why he doesn't give us the specific date. But I do think he's very much honored when we say to him, we celebrate this day to honor you coming into the world. Powerful, right? Okay, one last thing I'm going to give you, and then I'll I'll close it out. But here's a big one. So what is the first reference of Christmas? Well, everybody knows this in the Gospels. What if I told you the first reference for Christmas wasn't even in the Gospels? It was actually in the very first book of the Bible. Want to see it? No? You just want to go home? Okay, here we go. Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15. Genesis 3, you know it is the fall of man right? The very beginning. So you know God made the garden. He made the heavens and the earth. He made the garden. He put the two people in the garden. Who are they? Adam and Eve and put them in there and said, what? 
be fruitful and multiply, subdue it. You know, this is your world right now. This is yours. And I'll come out every evening. We'll talk. We'll fellowship. We'll hang out. And then we know that somehow along the way, we don't know how long, the Bible doesn't tell us, but somewhere along the way, there was a tree that she was not supposed to eat of with a certain fruit. It wasn't, just so you know, it wasn't an apple. <laughs> Everyone said, oh, she took by the apple. No, the Bible never tells you what kind of fruit. So I like to think it's the nastiest fruit I could think of. Like, I think, honestly, it's a tomato. Because you're going right now, you go, I thought tomato was a vegetable. It's not a vegetable, it's a what? Fruit. It's a fruit and it's nasty. Okay, people, it's nasty. The texture is nasty. Matter of fact, I think God came to her and said, listen, don't eat the tomato, wait for the salsa. <laughs> that will also be in my study Bible. I cannot prove that it's, gonna, that it's right or not, but it's the way I see it. All right. So here it is. So immediately right after that takes place, God comes down. He says, Adam, where are you? And he finds them, right? And he says, and they were clothed with fig leaves. And he says, why, why are you have clothes on? You know, which is kind of a weird question. Because usually when you're a parent and you see your kid running around naked, like, where are your clothes? <laughs> so it's like the, the opposite, right? And so he says, okay, so why, who told you that you were naked, right? And then they said, we saw our nakedness. And God says, who, who said that to you? And then, of course, it goes into it. So then he looks at the snake who was the deceiver. And, and it's not necessarily he's looking at the actual physical snake of an actual snake that's, that has no consciousness. He's actually talking, when he talks about the snake, he's talking about Satan, okay? So here it is, Genesis 3.15. It says, the Lord God said to the serpent, who is Satan, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. And on your belly you shall go. So many people believe that before the fall, snakes had legs. And after the fall, they were cursed. And it says this, you shall go and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And let me tell you something right now. I don't care if you're in here, but if you get offended, if you like snakes, you need help. Because <laughs> there's two things that happen to me when I see a snake. Either I jump back or, I, or I'm trying to find my gun. And then people go, but it's a good snake. Okay, you have a problem with that statement right there. The, the, theologically, there's no such thing as a good snake. But they eat the rodents and everything. Okay, I get it, I get it, but they're nasty. No, they're so beautiful. No, they're not. They're not. I'm sure your favorite color is black. Here we go. All right. And it says, this, I, and he says, verse 15, this is such a night. Verse 15 is the verse. This is the verse in which everything in the Bible hinges on. He says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman, talking about the serpent and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. If you ever read a King James Bible verse in this, the text isn't translated as offspring. It's actually translated as a seed. And he says that your seed will, will come against and will basically have, have war between the woman's seed. Now, Real quick biology lesson, real quick for you, okay? Women don't have seeds, they have eggs, okay? You with me? So what he was saying very clearly was, it's not you, the woman, it's what's going to produce from you. That's going to change it all. With me? Just three people. Okay, thank you, you three people, for being with me. All right. And so he says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring, your seed, and her seed, Listen, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his what? Yeah. Heel. This is the very first inclination or very first promise that God says, I am going to change what happened. I am going to bring into the world a person, a man, a baby that will come in and change what just happened. Now, let me give you a couple thoughts real quick, because in verse 15, it says it again. Pull that verse up again for me, if you would, because I want people to see it as I read it. The very first thing he says is, I what? Will. Here's what you need to know. God is the one who did it. He's the one that declares the war. He's the one that actually says, when this happened to us and we were deceived, listen, and the Bible says that as Adam and Eve seed, so all of humanity sinned and we all fell with them. He says, I am going to do this. In other words, he says, this is the plan. 
because of what you have done, now you're making me do this. So here's what I want you to know. This was God's plan from the very beginning. Never was a mistake. Never was a plan B. It was always plan A. You with me? All right, here's the second word I want you to see. He said the word is enmity. Here, here's what it means. It denotes a disposition of hostility. He's not saying we're going to war. He's saying, I hate what you have done. Matter of fact, I hate it so much, we're going to do something about it. There's certain kinds of people in this world that get mad and go home. Then there's people that get mad and do something about it. Those are the people you need to watch out for. Right? You can get mad and go home all you want. We're cool with it. But you get mad and you want to do something about it? Oh, snap. Right? And that's what God said. God said, I'm going to do something about this. Matter of fact, I'm going to put a wedge between what you have done and what I'm about to do. Why do you think when Jesus comes on the scene, why do you think that Satan was trying to kill him as a baby? Because he knew it was coming. Why do you think in your life when you try to do something for Jesus, listen to me, that is such a hard thing to do. Why is it that when you, you, you make choices for, to honor the Lord, you're like, why is this so hard? Why is this such a struggle? Because you have an enemy. Because you know what's going to happen? There's one thing for you to get mad at Satan and go home. There's another difference between you getting mad at Satan and doing something about it. We can Listen, Satan is cool with us coming to church. Right. Babies did good today. Mama's so proud. And then you go home, what's for dinner? But if you come to this service and you say to yourself, my life has to change, and then you walk out that door differently, what do you think is going to happen? That's when the real work starts. That's when God really begins to use us. Listen, do you, he says, he shall bruise your head. Now, I don't know about you, but there's a picture that I have as a person stepping on the head of the snake, and you see that snake just, just twist, right? You know what he's saying to Satan? I'm going to destroy what you did. Now, listen. Here's what you have to know. I know for some of us, we like Christmas, but for some of us this year, Christmas is very hard because you have lost people in your life. And you've lost friends and family members because, because of a death or an illness or an accident or whatever. And it's hard for you. Or maybe you lost a parent or a child. Listen to me. Listen to what I'm saying. That, you, that, you, that for you, sometimes Christmas has really, really dark moments. Matter of fact, let me say this to you. The number one time of the year where all suicides take place worldwide, can you guess what it is? Christmas. Listen to me. Christmas. And Jesus, it, it, listen, the reason why he came is he says, I'm going to make everything right. So when he steps on the head by his act on the cross, he took the one thing that Satan had, death. And Jesus says, you no longer control death. That's why the Bible tells us that when he died, he went into the pits of hell and he grabbed the keys of hell and death and he wears them on his waist. You know why he's saying that what you started, I'm going to take over. That's what Christmas is. And you have to know this. So when you're going through your depression, listen to me, you're going through your depression, you're battling and you're going through it. Here's what I want to tell you. Jesus died to take that over and that, that death and that, that, that separation, he says, will not, not last forever. It won't last forever because of my sacrifice, I now control hell and death. And through me, all can live again and live forever. And never experience that death. That's what Christmas is. Christmas is so much more than all these things that we teach our kids. It's so much deeper. It's about Christ coming in the world as a child and taking God, taking the form of a baby and saying, I'm, I'm taking back what belongs to me. Amen. It's powerful, right? It Let me just give you this real quick and I'll go close. You ready? The significance that we just read in this passage, number one, it creates an expectation of a coming Savior. Can you imagine 
the weight that was lifted off of Adam and Eve when they said, what did we just do? Now, you got to remember, but they were in a perfect marriage. They're the only couple. Think about this. They're the only couple that gets married in a perfect setting. Everything was perfect. Adam always took out the trash. He always washed the dishes. He never argued. Eve never nagged. Right? They never had a mirror that says, does this body make me look fat? You with me? It was perfect. And they had a perfect relationship. And when all that took place, everything in their relationship changed. The only couple that experienced it. So can you imagine that first night they're saying to each other, what, what did we just do? And here God comes in in the great, okay, the greatest sin ever committed, right? Comes in and says, don't worry, I'm going to take care of it. So if God's going to do that to Adam and Eve and says, I'm going to take care of it, why are you carrying the stuff that you carry? You don't think he's going to come down and sit with you and say, I'll take care of it? Why do you carry your guilt the way you carry it? You shouldn't have to. Why, why are you scared of God? You've heard people say that. Oh, I go to church, but if I went to church, the, the whole thing would fall in. No, it would be, that's not because of you. It's because of a bad building. <laughs> right? But God cares about you. He loves you so much that he says, I'm going to correct all of it, but I need you to trust me. So there's a promise of a Savior. Second thing is this, it places the emphasis on the offspring of Mary and not Mary. That's why we don't worship or pray to Mary. Mary was just a vessel. Can I tell you something else about Mary? You, those of us who maybe who grew up in a Catholic church, don't get mad at me. I'm just going to give you the truth. She wasn't a perpetual virgin. What I mean by that is she didn't stay a virgin her entire life. Joseph and Mary had kids after Jesus because Joseph went to her and said, yo, I know we did the Jesus thing, but girl. <laughs> Jesus had brothers, man. He had, he had siblings. Well, why is that? Because the Bible tells us very clearly. As a matter of fact, one of them's in your Bible. His name is James. Jesus' half-brother wrote James. He was also, what was amazing about James is James didn't even believe in Jesus, his brother. Can you blame him? Those of us with older brothers, oh, please. If my brother came to me and said, I'm the same, I'd be like, really? The Savior? I'm so sick of you being perfect. I bring home C's, you bring home A's. Why can't you? Be, I mean, can you imagine? Why can't you be more like Jesus? He's never sick. He never complains. Yeah, because he's out in the back turning water into wine. He's having a good time. So the emphasis isn't on, listen, Mary, it's on her offspring. It's on who is coming. So, it, it, so basically, so it places the power of salvation completely on the cross. Christmas is about the cross. Listen, it's about the cross. Someone said to me, well, when did Jesus know that he was going to be crucified? The Bible doesn't tell us, but it says that as he matured and grew in the Lord, the Spirit began to reveal things to him up to the point where he was 12 years old. The things that he would teach in the temple, it blew everybody's mind. He had the rabbi sitting at his feet at 12. Something special about this kid. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So here's what I want you to know. Christmas is about God working his plan out from the very beginning of time to claim and to take back, listen to me, what belongs to him. Amen. So let me give you just uh, an encouragement as you celebrate your Christmas time this week. Let me just remind you that it's okay to have the Santa. It's okay to have the reindeers. It's okay to have the little elves and all that kind of stuff. But listen, that cannot be our focus cannot be our focus. He has to be the focus. So if you're a parent 
I just want to encourage you to sit down and read Luke chapter 2 to your kids. Let them know what Christmas is all about. It's about Jesus coming back and claiming and taking what was his, which was you. You are the greatest present. It's you. And those of us who are struggling with Christmas and we're having a hard time with it, just know this, that he came and took everything that brings you hurt and pain, he came to make that right. And you will not have to live with that hurt and pain forever. Just, be, just, just know that one day you will see your loved ones face to face and they're going to look at you and go, where have you been? This is amazing. Look at what God is doing. Amen? Amen. All right, let's bow our heads. I just want to pray over you. Just take a moment.